Committee will come to order. Today, we will be considering legislation to strengthen the oversight of stimulus spending and to increase the independence of the watchdogs at financial regulatory agencies. We also will consider the Federal Employees Paid Parental Leave Act, which provides four weeks of paid leave to new parents in the Federal workforce. Lastly, we have several postal namings and resolutions to consider. Before we turn to our legislative business, I want to welcome two new members of our committee. Mike Quigley was recently elected to represent the 5th District of Illinois, which is located in Chicago. Congressman Quigley was formerly a Cook County Commissioner and, and focused on government reform and transparency issues. So he brings that expertise to our committee. And then we have Marcy Capture, who represents the 9th District of Ohio, is, a, is new to this committee, but let me tell you, she's not new to the United States Congress. In fact, uh, we started out together back in 1983. We are fortunate to have Ms. Capture, and of course, we're adding her to the committee as well. And she also serves on appropriations, and of course, that's always good for us here to have someone from appropriations on our committee. So we welcome both of you to our committee. I now call up HR. Well, the chairman's doing that. I'll take the liberty of also welcome, welcome you, and particularly, uh, uh, Mike, I don't want to leave you out, but Marcy, it's so good to be on the same committee with you after so many years of traveling together but not serving on the same committee. So welcome. In fact, I yield to both of you now, if you'd like to make a comment. <laughs> I'll yield. Well, I really wanted uh, Congressman Quigley to have the first few words here, but he insists that I that I go first. I think that's... He respects uh, seniority. <laughs> that's very generous. And Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Issa, and all my dear friends on, on this committee, I um, uh, was very fortunate to be able to um, get this committee uh, on temporary assignment through steering and policy uh, in our caucus. And I'm very grateful because of the work that you are doing and will do uh, on oversight uh, on everything from the TARP uh, and domestic programs uh, to uh, certain um, investigatory work and, uh, that, and oversight work that you do in terms of our economy. And I just welcome the opportunity to offer whatever I might to this, uh, to this committee and, and several of its subcommittees and couldn't be happier uh, on this level than to be sitting between my dear friends from Illinois, Congressman Davis and uh, Congressman Quigley. I think I'm, I'm anchored on both sides. So, uh, and also obviously with Congresswoman Maloney uh, respecting the work that she does on so many levels in the Congress and uh, just happy to be here with my colleague from Ohio, uh, Mr. Driehaus and uh, Mr. Welch and uh, I know how able they are. So well, we look forward to supporting you, Mr. Chairman, in your great efforts this Congress. Thank Deli you. Delighted to have you. Uh, Congressman Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee and everyone here. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be here and working with you. It's just by way of introduction. Uh, our door is always open. We're willing to help anyone and everyone. We just hope to bring the spirit of what we were trying to do in Chicago and Cook County on reform uh, here. And uh, we would like to do the best we can. If there's anything we can do, please let us know. Um, and uh, our office is where uh, Rom's office was. Uh, I was told it's haunted, but uh, <laughs> Uh, we're in a great location. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, and delighted to have both of you to join the committee. Now we call up H.R. 626, the Federal Employees Paid Leave Act of 2009. The bill provides four work weeks of paid leave to new mothers and fathers in the federal government. The legislation has enjoyed bipartisan support in successive Congresses. Last year, it was approved by this committee and passed the House of Representatives. I'd like to thank Congresswoman Maloney for her outstanding leadership on this issue. 
Our meeting today has focused on the committee's efforts to provide appropriate oversight and legislation in these difficult economic times. Without proper oversight, the Federal Government's efforts to turn around the economy will not work for the American people. We also need to recognize that the Federal Government is the largest employer in the United States, and its policies in this area set a tone for the country. No employee should have to choose between caring for a new child and their paycheck. This is especially true during an economic downturn. By providing four weeks of paid parental leave, H.R. 626 makes a sound investment in the federal workforce. This will help the government retain and attract young, talented employees. And in so doing, it provides potential cost savings to the American people. The taxpayers directly benefit when the government retains existing employees, rather than having to hire, train, retrain new ones. And the country is better served by an experienced and productive federal workforce that is able to adequately provide for the health and well-being of their newborn or newly adopted children. I do believe that H.R. 626 complements the committee's ongoing efforts to prescribe appropriate policies to deal with the economic crisis. I am pleased we are considering it today, and I urge all members to join me in supporting this bill. At this time, I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, remember this bill coming up in the last Congress, and I would like to commend uh, members of the majority who made some changes in this bill, which I believe are moderating in its cost and, uh, and reach. However, I continue to oppose the bill for a number of reasons. First of all, <clears throat> this bill continues to uh, include uh, foster children who could be adopted on an annual basis. Literally, as I read the bill, you could still have one adoption or one foster child uh, per year resulting in uh, every year you get a new foster child, every year if a husband and wife, if they are both Federal workers, would take four weeks off with pay because they had simply taken a new foster child. Although I approve and support people taking in foster children, the question is, is that a reasonable limitation on this bill? Having said that, there were some differences between the last bill that were favorable. Uh, I do not expect to, uh, to vote for this bill, but for a new reason. I believe in this Congress the cost of $850 million over five years, uh, as scored independently, over $2 billion over 10 years, comes at a time in which the Federal Government cannot send a message that while everyone else is laying off, we are not only hiring and growing, but in fact adding benefits to the workforce. So I would uh, look forward to continuing to work on this bill if it does not become law in the next Congress and the Congress beyond, uh, particularly as the economy improves and we may be able to find some middle ground. With that, I yield back. Do any other members seek recognition? The, con the lady from New York, Congresswoman Maloney. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I thank you for your leadership on, on this committee and, and particularly on issues of work family balance uh, and paid parental leave. Of course, I'd also like to uh, thank Chairman Lynch and uh, Danny Davis uh, for their support and for helping to shepherd H.R. 626 through the subcommittee. I, I have introduced this legislation along with uh, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer for the past 10 years and was pleased when a bill identical to it passed the House in a bipartisan manner with a strong vote of 278 to 146 during the past uh, Congress. H.R. 626 responds to the needs of tens of thousands of working families in the Federal Government by providing four weeks of paid parental leave for the birth, adoption, or fostering of a child. I do want to note that in the audience today are a number of Federal employees, some of whom are pregnant, who are here in support of the bill. And I would also like to place in the record uh, letters from the National Federation of Independent Business in support of the bill. Without the, objection. The National Treasury Employees Union, the National Partnership for Women and Families, American Federation of Government Employees, National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association, and the Federally Employed Women. All of these letters. 
Without uh, a paid leave, instead of celebrating the birth of a child, many of these families are forced to choose between a paycheck and caring for the newborn, a choice no one should have to make. In 1993, the very first bill that I voted on was the Family and Medical Leave Act. I had had a child uh, while I worked for the state government and was terrified that I'd be fired. I was told, uh, you leave and you don't come back if you have a child. Well, fortunately, things have happened since then. Uh, but this landmark legislation was uh, really critical uh, in the impact on people's lives. I hear it from many people that they uh, were able to take care of a sick parent or a birth of a new child without the fear of being fired. But many people cannot take family and medical leave because they can't afford to. They need their paycheck. And I must note that there has, although there is a lot of rhetoric in the House of Representatives about work-family balance, there has been no other additional legislation it, that has been passed in the Congress to balance work and family since the Family and Medical Leave Act 16 years ago. Even as the American family has changed dramatically, most families, both the man and the woman, have to work. Women contribute at least a third of the family income and in many cases are the sole person providing for the family. And uh, you need both salaries in order to get by. Even before the economic crisis, many, millions of dual earner couples were struggling to stay afloat on two incomes. Now with massive job losses, many of these families are scrambling to pay the bills on just one income. Without paid leave, the birth of a child means that many working families are left with no income at all. By providing four weeks of paid leave to federal workers who currently receive no paid leave for the birth, adoption, or fostering of a child, we can diminish the risk of real economic hardship for the 1.8 million employees of America's largest employer, the federal government. There are many reasons we should uh, vote for this bill today. H.R. 626 is pay-go neutral. It won't cost any money. While some have cited concerns about the cost of this reform, CBO has stated that this legislation is PAYGO neutral and that enacting the bill would not affect direct spending or receipts. Obviously, when someone leaves, other people come in and take their job. Many younger people will be given greater responsibility. So it's a win-win in all respects. To, to be clear, there is no cost to the taxpayers under this bill in the form of increased taxes or decreased revenue. Not reflected in the CBO scores is the cost savings of providing paid parental leave. This benefit can save the government money by reducing turnover. It costs roughly 20% of an employee's salary to hire and train new workers, compared with about 8% to provide a longstanding employee with a few weeks of paid leave. H.R. 626 helps families while helping the economy. New parents are expected to spend an average of $11,000 in additional expenses in the year that a child is born. By ensuring that new families' incomes stay steady, paid leave ensures that their consumption remains steady too, and this is what drives economic growth. When we invest in families by providing paid parental leave, we're investing in the future of our country. Paid leave improves children's health outcomes, lowers the morality rate, Ours is the highest among industrialized countries, improves the economic status of families and enhances both employees' productivity and the economic returns to employers. 163 countries recognize the importance of providing paid leave to families. 163 countries cannot be wrong. The United States is tied for last in support for family leave and we are tied with Lesotho, Swaziland, and Papua New Guinea. It is time we joined the other 163 countries in the world that provide paid leave and support for new families. Uh, finally, I ask my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, when is the right time to enact family-friendly policies? As I mentioned, I have had this bill for 10 years in both good times and bad times, during economic boom times. And when the other side was in the majority during a period of great economic growth, they did not support paid family leave. Now when we're struggling, they don't support it. So I would just say they don't support it. We could be uh, you know, affluent. We could have a, you know, a great boom. They'd still be opposed to this family-friendly work balance 
necessary piece of legislation that moves us from 163, the worst in the world, uh, up with the other uh, progressive, family-friendly oriented countries. The now time that is families expired. are struggling, it is time to help them out in a modest way, and providing four weeks is, is very important. I, I ask uh, if I could respond to the two, two uh, obstacles that my good friend and colleague raised on the other side of the aisle, or should I do that later? You can do that later, because okay. gentlewoman's time has expired. Yeah. Yeah. It, yes, Mr. Connolly from Virginia. Uh, thank you. Uh, one second, let me. No. Thank All you. right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just ask unanimous consent that the, uh, a letter from the uh, national uh, NFIB be entered into the record opposing this bill. Without, ob Without objections. Without objection. Mr. Connolly. From Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to add my support for this legislation. And in addition to the many uh, reasons both uh, yourself and, and, and the gentlelady from New York have indicated, um, I would actually uh, suggest to uh, the distinguished ranking member that as we move forward with the federal workforce, I'm not sure we can, af we can afford not to do this. Uh, if we're looking at recruitment and retention of a federal workforce, 40% uh, of which is going to be eligible for retirement over the next decade, if we're going to attract the best and the brightest competing with the private sector, this is something increasingly younger workers expect to be part of the benefit package. Um, I just finished being chairman of a, a very large county in Fairfax County. We felt compelled to add this very benefit to our workforce if we were going to stay competitive in terms of uh, competing with the private sector and other public sectors uh, for the best and the brightest, for the skilled workforce of the future. So I don't think the question is we can't afford this. I think the real question is can we afford not to do this as we look to the uh, personnel requirements of the federal workforce of the future. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen from Virginia. In, anyone else seeking recognition? Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very on. much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me commend you on your leadership. But I also want to commend and congratulate Representative Maloney. You know, 10 years is a long period of time, and it's actually more than 10 now. But to have the stay in power to pursue legislative enactment over that period of time is an indication of its importance. So, Representative Maloney, I've always been told that uh, the race is not won by the swiftest or the strong, but she who endureth until the end. And so you have endured, and we are faced with passage. I was pleased to hear the ranking member, distinguished ranking member from California, raise the issue of foster care. May happens to be Foster Care Month, National Foster Care Month. And I believe that the greatness of a society can be measured by how well it treats its young, how well it treats its old, and how well it looks after those who have difficulty caring for themselves. I happen to represent a district that has the largest number of children in foster care in the United States of America. Thirty-four percent of the children who live in my congressional district live with someone other than their natural parents. And I would be delighted if federal workers or any other workers were adopting one of these children every year. As a matter of fact, I'd give them a Medal of Honor if every year they found that they could adopt another child because there is a tremendous need for children to be adopted. But when I look at the group of individuals who have come this afternoon to indicate support for the legislation, they really represent the faces of the future, the faces of America. Many of them will be rearing children and the quality of life for these children will actually determine the future direction of our country. And so I am in strong support of this legislation, urge that we move ahead because if not now, then when? If not us, then who? 
It's a great piece of legislation. It's great for those who work for the federal government. It's great for the country because you quite frankly cannot lead where you don't go. And if our federal government is to demonstrate the leadership for others to follow, then this is a tremendous example to begin with. Again, I commend you, Representative Maloney, urge passage of this legislation, and you're back the balance of my time. Uh, recognize the gentlewoman from D.C., Ms. Norton. Um, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I, I think that um, parents and those who want to be parents all over the United States are going to be indebted uh, to Ms. Maloney for hanging in there. Uh, we are a two-paid, two-parent workforce, and yet the society has given almost no recognition of that fact. We, we went some long uh, way when we in, 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 in enacted unpaid fa family leave. We congratulated ourselves. But I think Ms. Maloney and others have looked at who that has benefited. It has benefited uh, women who were married and who continue to have an income. It has benefited upper income women who work in workplaces uh, where uh, they have um, some, um, generally some greater um, uh, latitude. But who has it not benefited? Uh, there is no way in which a case can be made that the average women, woman worker has been benefited by saying if you're willing to give up four, eight, or and even 12 weeks, we are very generous uh, of uh, salary, then you can have the time off. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have a, and have had for some time, a very low rate of birth in this country. People have to think about whether they should have children at all, because there are virtually no accommodations to working mothers in the American work, workforce today. And so what do we do here today that is so generous? We don't allocate an amount of money to pay for four weeks of paid leave. All we do is to say to the agencies that out of the money they already have for salaries and expenses, if they can find it, they can pay for leave. Uh, that, of course, costs the government nothing. Agencies that decide that the workforce is very valuable to them and who have the funds now have a way uh, to, in fact, recognize these, these women and keep these women. Above all, Mr. Mr. Chairman, what we do here is to lead by example. And that's what the government should always do when it comes to benefits of this kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlewoman. Uh, no other speakers. We call up H.R. 626 to be considered. H.R. 626, a bill to provide that four of the 12 weeks Could, of parental leave. The bill leave. is considered as read, open for amendment at any point, uh, without objection, so ordered. Are there any amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 626 to the House with the recommendations that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 626 to the House. All those in favor say aye. aye. Poses? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 626 is ordered reported. Next. Next, yeah. Next, we go to um, H.R. 2182. I now call up H.R. 2182, the Enhanced Oversight of State and Local Economic Recovery Act. H.R. 2182, a bill to amend the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 to provide Let for the bill be considered as read. I would like to thank Ranking Member Isa and the other original co-sponsors of this legislation for working with us on the legislation in a bipartisan fashion. The result is a strong bill which addresses a troubling omission in the Recovery Act. This legislation grew out of a hearing the committee has held on the Recovery Act. 
many state and local auditors and others responsible for overseeing spending of stimulus dollars have pointed out to us that in these troubled economic times, they are under tremendous pressure to conduct, conduct, con conduct their normal oversight work and let alone cope with the increase with the Recovery Act re requires. Our hearings have made clear that state and local governments need additional resources to monitor the large infusion of funds with the Recovery Act directs. The bill will provide state and local governments with the flexibility to set aside a portion of their stimulus funds for auditing, contract and grant planning and management, and investigations of waste, fraud and abuse. The bill also permits state and local governments to use the federal supply schedules of the General Services Administration for stimulus projects. The GSA schedules are pre-negotiated federal contracts for a range of common goods and services. This is a win, 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 because it will allow state and local governments to acquire certain items without engaging in time-consuming contracting procedures while guaranteeing the lowest price for them. Lastly, H.R. 2182 requires the Office of Management and Budget to give detailed guidance to state and local governments to ensure consistency in their reporting of job creation data. Our state and local governments are on the front line of the efforts to fight manage, mismanagement of Recovery Act dollars. Their success is vital to making the stimulus work for the American people. I want to again, again thank the ranking member Congressman Issa of California, as well as Representative Kucinich and Platts and Welch and Conley for all working with me on this bill. I should note that the legislation incorporates part of H.R. 1911, which was introduced by Representative Conley. This is a strong bill that urge members to support. I urge all members to support it, and I yield to the ranking member for his comments at this time. Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for the fact that this comes today as a completely bipartisan uh, a piece of legislation and one that grew out of our experiences in your hometown of Brooklyn. Uh, I think, as often happens in Congress, we, we, we hurry to do important work and we leave something out. This committee has a solemn obligation to look for what we left out, and in this case, providing uh, state and local governments with the specifically required funds for them to oversee this vast amount of money is essential. As the Chairman knows in hearings here, we have been told that 5 percent waste or mis misspending of money is typical in any piece of legislation leaving here. In this case, the likelihood is without very strong oversight, it would be even greater. In other words, Mr. Chairman, the expenditure of less than $4 billion to oversee these funds properly is likely to save us anywhere from 40 to $80 billion in waste, fraud and misuse. Mr. Chairman, this bill will allow state and local governments to use a small portion of the funds awarded under the Recovery Act for auditing and investigations of waste, fraud and abuse. I think my colleagues share with me on a unanimous basis the view that these funds going directly to auditing and investigations and not substitute for any other overhead are an appropriate direction and a perfecting of the earlier legislation. Finally, I hope this, this bill will put to an end any question about whether or not this committee's most vital function, which is looking at legislation before, during and after the fact, will continue to be a bipartisan effort in order to prevent a waste of precious federal dollars. I urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to have letters in support of this legislation be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yeah. Any other members seek to be recognized? Congressman Conley from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank you for your leadership and for your gracious remarks. Um, this is how the process is supposed to work. We had a hearing. We uncovered a problem. Mr. Devaney, uh, uh, who uh, heads up the RAT and is a distinguished IG, indicated to us that it was perhaps an oversight in the original legislation not permitting federal agencies and state governments, who after all are charged with oversight and implementation of the Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds, to have the same prerogatives federal programs were allowed in the legislation. So we're fixing that oversight. 
identified by this committee in our own hearing process. And again, Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted to join with you and the ranking member and others uh, in as an original co-sponsor of this legislation. Uh, and I really think it's going to make a difference, as, Mr. as the ranking member just indicated, in actually saving money and making us more efficient, more transparent, and more accountable in the implementation of the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Thank you, gentlemen, for his kind words. Thank you. Anybody else seeking to be recognized? Yes, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think this is, 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 is an important um, bill, and I, I certainly hope the, the um, states uh, take advantage of the bill. Um, the um, most, uh, when you consider the number of programs that are funded by the stimulus bill in a state, there's almost no important part of government that is not funded. When you add to that the need to quickly spend this money and the overwhelming need for the money, the chances of fraud, waste, and abuse grow beyond anything that might have occurred in the ordinary course of business so that without some enhanced funding, I don't know how we can expect everything to come out fine. Uh, so being proactive here was, was, is, is, I think, very important. I have not enjoyed what we experienced with, uh, with after the fact, IG reports about, I don't know, the Iraq war or Katrina, the, where you are forced into a gotcha position. Somebody's got to ask, why didn't somebody try to get them ahead of time so that, that this could have been avoided and taxpayer waste could have been avoided? Uh, as um, as the chair of a, a subcommittee that has jurisdiction over GSA, I particularly applaud uh, the use of the uh, general uh, the the um, general schedule uh, as a very efficient and low cost relative to the costs in the general marketplace to get goods and services uh, to the states now as well as to the federal government. So thank you both for for this, and I thank the uh, ranking member for his initiative as well. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlewoman from uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing me to speak in support of H.R. 2182, the Enhanced Oversight of State and Local Economic Recovery Act. This legislation will provide critical assistance to state and local governments in their planning and oversight of the use of Recovery Act funds. The responsibility associated with the Recovery Act to revitalize the American economy while assisting those most affected by the recession will largely be borne by the state and local actors responsible for vetting projects and distributing these funds. As a result, the assistance this bill offers to state and local governments for costs associated with auditing, contract, and grant planning, and investigations of waste, fraud, and abuse is crucial to ensuring the success of the Recovery Act. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you and Ranking Member Issa for introducing this important legislation. I urge all to support this. Thank you, and I give back my time. Thank you, thank you very much. I uh, yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, say how much I appreciate uh, you and our ranking member, Mr. Issa, working together and trying to make certain that we do protect uh, uh, incredible amounts of taxpayers' funds that we spent in a hurry, that we're trying to expend in a hurry, and that we don't want to seem uh, wasted in a hurry. Um, this uh, is a good common sense proposal. Uh, I'm the ranking member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and we, we actually have a small slice of the, what is it, a nearly $800 billion bill. Ours is about $80 billion, we'll say, that we are trying to keep track of. Mr. Oberstar and I are doing hearings, reviews. Um, one of the interesting things, though, is a great deal of this money 
is going out to states under formulas uh, and uh, we found uh, that we are getting the money out, but states, there are a couple of things that come into play. States have confusion about how they can disperse the money because of federal regs or red tape we've set up, which is one issue. And then where they are getting it out, uh, I, I, we've already seen the need to, uh, to, to conduct good audit and oversight. Now, you do have us uh, sort of auditing, giving up bulk, huge bulk amounts of dollars to these entities, but they're dispersing it, and we don't have the oversight at the next level, nor do we have sometimes the dispersal at the next level that we may have in, intended or uh, required. So this, I think, would be uh, tremendously helpful, taking a small amount of money, uh, because they are also being asked to handle huge amounts of money and using it for a very good purposes, which, which is to conduct audits and, and oversight. So I, I uh, uh, once again, Mr. Towns, uh, uh, you've stepped up to the plate in a good bipartisan manner. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think the taxpayers will be rewarded by your efforts. So pleased to speak in favor of uh, your work and Mr. Ice's work and yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman for his kind words. Any other members seeking to be recognized? Yes, uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two things. One, I just want to agree with Mr. Micah. You know, it's kind of a the weather's changed or something. We've got two uh, members, the chairman and the ranking member, uh, united in the goal of making this committee do something effective for the American people. Uh, obviously, there'll be uh, times when we disagree about conclusions, but uh, what's uh, just tremendous is to see the unity of purpose. So I want to thank you, and uh, I want to thank Mr. Issa for a tremendous work and join Mr. Micah in that observation. Second, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding the hearing today, but I want to uh, also thank you for allowing us to participate in the New York field hearing on the committee. And I understand that the testimony at that hearing was instrumental in helping us craft this bill. Uh, this was a very important piece of legislation in my view, a necessary attempt to respond to the uh, uh, economic situation, that's the stimulus package. But we all agree that we've got to start taking precautions to ensure that that stimulus money, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, be executed with strict oversight. That's the goal. Uh, I've spoken to the Vermont auditor, Tom Salmon, who is equally committed to ensuring that the stimulus money be spent effectively and responsibly. And what's tremendous about this legislation is we're partnering with our uh, uh, colleagues in the state. Uh, is an auditor, he knows the importance of collecting accurate da data to prevent and detect fraud. His main concern was whether H.R. 2182 would allow state and local governments to use the money uh, in the act for the development of information systems and tracking and reporting tools to meet the law's transparency requirements. It's my understanding that those costs would be permissible under the legislation before us. Uh, just to clarify, I'd yield to you uh, if you had a reply to that, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you first for yielding. Uh, uh, I do believe that uh, the gentleman's interpretation is correct and that those costs would be permissible as administrative overhead under the provision of the Recovery Act uh, amended by this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other members seeking recognition? I ask that we call up H.R. 2182. H.R. 2182, a bill to amend the American Recovery and Reinvestment Considered Act. Considered bill is read, uh, open for amendment at any point without objections, so ordered. Are there any amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2182 to the House with the recommendations that the bill do pass. Uh, the question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2182 to the House. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. All opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 2182 is ordered reported. The next order of business is H.R. 885, the Improved Financial and Commodity Markets Oversight and Accountability Act. 
This bill introduced by Representative John Larson of Connecticut would enhance the independence of inspector generals at key financial regulatory agencies. Right now, we have an inconsistent system where some agencies like the FDIC have an inspector general appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, while other large and important agencies like the SEC have an inspector general who is appointed by and reports to the head of the agency they are supposed to be investigating. This bill would create a more consistent and independent structure by the elevating inspector generals to five financial regulatory agencies to be presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed. This will enhance their independence from their agencies they are overseeing. Uh, Ms. Watson held a hearing on this bill in the subcommittee on government management where it had the support of GAO and good government groups. The agency's IGs made some suggestions on improving the bill, which we have incorporated in the manager's amendment that I will offer. Inspector generals have the unique responsibility of reporting both to the President and to Congress. Congress has to make sure that IGs have the legal authority and tools they need to continue their role as nonpartisan, professional, honest brokers, and this bill does that. I yield now to the ranking member. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we have noted all year, oversight and accountability are critically important, and the inspectors general are on the front line of this effort. This bill will enhance the independence and effectiveness of the inspector generals at several critical institutions. Currently, the IGs at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the National Credit Union Administration, Securities Exchange Commission, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System are appointed and can be removed by the head of the institution. This structure could limit the IG's independence. This bill would make those IG's presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed. Although additional Senate confirmed positions are unnecessary in most cases, it is important that we preserve their independence within their respective institutions. I want to thank you for working with us to improve this bill. I understand that the manager's amendment will ensure that the positions covered by this bill will not suffer a reduction in pay and the individuals will remain on par to similarly situated senior officials at the institution. More importantly, the amendment will also provide IGs with subpoena authority, an important tool for oversight and accountability, as you well know from our work here. Finally, the bill requires the regulatory agencies to take some action on the deficiencies identified by IGs. The agencies cannot simply ignore the findings. Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support this measure. Thank you, the gentleman, for his kind words. Uh, anyone else seeking recognition? That's unanimous consent that H.R. 885 be considered as read and open for amendments at any point without objection, so order. I have a manager's amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 885, offered by Mr. Towns of New York. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. And I recognize myself for five minutes. This amendment fixes some of the issues identified at the hearing on the bill. I, it ensures the career, the career executives who become inspector generals at these agencies do not have their pay cut if they are appointed by the president, and that employees in these offices continue under existing personnel authorities. It also adds authority to subpoena testimony from contractors, grantees, and persons regulated by the agency in the course of an investigation. Currently, the IG can interview employees and review agency documents and subpoena documents from outside parties, but cannot interview outside persons doing business with the agency. And it requires agency heads to implement IG recommendations or explain to Congress why they are not doing so. This follows up on the report we issued in January finding more than 13,000 IG recommendations that had not been implemented at federal agencies. I yield to the ranking member of the, of the committee for his comments, if you, have, if you have any. Thank you. I addressed most of them in my opening statement, but once again, I want to thank you for the pay and particularly for the subpoena power because, and the implementation because we've seen this. It takes about one year in the committee to realize it's essential. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Benyana, any other comments? Oh, Mr. Chairman. The quick. Uh, be delighted to yield to the gentleman from Washington. Yeah. Um, I, I, 
you, you, um, this this presages a bill I was uh, uh, that had not, had nothing to do with the Recovery Act, which I was going to um, introduce this year because as a result of what we went through last year uh, with the GAO, I discovered much to my chagrin, frankly, that there were agencies that where the IG was not appointed by the president, but that you could appoint your own IG. I guess now that we have a, a Recovery Act and financial uh, problems, we understand that that just won't do. It doesn't seem to me why it would ever have done. I think it may have had to do with the size of the agency, but I must say this is long overdue and I strongly endorse the appointment of anybody who is supposed to be independent uh, by someone outside of the agency itself. So we've done a real good deed here as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, gentlemen, for your comments. You're right. There's been some serious problems because you have a situation where the director was responsible for the inspector general, and if they started inspecting the wrong thing, they cut the budget. <laughs> it, it happens. But yes. The question is on adopting the town's amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 885 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 885 to the House. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 885 is ordered reported. The next order of business is postal naming bills and resolutions. I ask unanimous consent that those that these resolutions be considered in block and as read and open to amendment at any point. The resolution includes H. Con Res 84, introduced by Representative Zach Womp. This measure supports the goal and objectives of a National Military Appreciation Month. H.R. Res 356 introduced by Representative Ralph Hall. This measure expressed support for the designation of February 8, 2010 as Boy Scouts of America Day in the celebration of the nation's largest youth scouting organization uh, and, uh, and of course it recognizes 100th anniversary. I have an amendment that makes technical changes to the title of the measure and I ask unanimous consent that these amendments be adopted without objection. H.R. Res 37 introduced by Representative Paul Tonko. This measure expressed support for the designation of April the 27th, 2009 as National Healthy School Day. I have an amendment to reflect support for the general designation of National Healthy School Day and I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be adopted without objection, so ordered. H. Res 388 introduced by Representative Jeff Fortenberry. Uh, this measure celebrates the role of mothers in the United States and supports the goal and ideas of Mother's Day. H.R. 1817 introduced by Representative Marsha Blackburn. This bill designates a facility of the United States Postal Service in Somerville, Tennessee as the John S. Wilder Post Office Building. H.R. 2090, introduced by Representative John McHugh. Uh, this bill designated facility of the United States Postal Service in Ogdenburg, New York, as the Frederick Remington Post Office Building. H.R. 2162, introduced by Representative Walter Minnick. This bill designated a facility in the United States Postal Service in Napa, Idaho, as the Herbert A. Littleton Postal Station. H.R. 2170 introduced by Representative Michael Michard. This bill designate a facility of the United States Postal Service in Islands Fall, Maine as the Carl B. Smith Post Office. And H.R. 2174 introduced by Representative Michael Michard. This bill designates a facility in the United States Postal Service in the Holland, Maine and the Clyde Hitchborn Post Office. These are all worthy measures that meet the standards of the committee and I urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have also reviewed these postal namings and resolutions and find they meet the requirements of the committee. Uh, it's not very often you get the vote to appreciate the military, Boy Scouts, moms, and healthy schools at the same time. <laughs> I only missed apple pie in that. Uh, I, I thank you for your work. <laughs> thank you. Any other, <laughs> any other comments? Okay. I ask unanimous consent that the measure previously described be reported favorably by the committee without objection. It is ordered. This concludes our business of today. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered reported without objection. So ordered, the committee now stands adjourned. <laughs>